sweep, the playoff sweep, change your view of the, of the team and the season? It doesn't change anything about the season. I, I think we've got to bifurcate those two things to a certain degree. Um, you know, we lost four games coming in to the playoffs, and that didn't change everyone's overall outlook on a macro level. Um, you know, the, I think the playoffs brought a couple of issues to bear in terms of, you know, teams that can go small. Um, you know, I think those are some things we need to address. But, you know, playoff, playoff series are always going to illustrate, um, you know, deficiencies, right? That's what coaches do. They get to play you four different times. They find your weaknesses. And, you know, we, we'll address those in the offseason. Um, you know, regardless whether we lost, we got swept, we lost 4-3, we get into the second round, nothing's going to go unexamined in the organization. It's just a matter of, um, I think this one was so extreme, I don't want to overreact to one unfavorable matchup in a team that just played outstanding basketball. Um, you know, you, you just can't do that, Joe. You just can't react to, well, now we have to overreact to how, when we play this style of basketball. So, look, we're going to do everything we can to upgrade the roster like we always do, um, but we're also not going to lose sight of the success we had throughout the course of the season and the growth that we had. I mean the team. The whole team. Yeah. How stunned were you? Pardon me? How stunned were you with the way it all unfolded? I think we all are, actually. You know, I think that was the recurring theme um, in the exit interviews was, you know, nobody has any plane flights scheduled today because, you know, nobody expected it to happen. But it did. You know, we had our chances in game one. We had our chances in game two. Um, you know, clearly game three, you know, was a big setback. And then last night, same thing. You know, I, I was really proud of the way the guys came back on the road in the fourth quarter, made it a one possession game multiple times. And um, I, I, I think stunned, I think disappointed. But, you know, I think you also have to keep in perspective. You know, we were the three seed. We were a game ahead of New Orleans. We split with them during the season. Um, you know, the one time that we beat them, you know, as constructed, when they did play small with, with uh, Miritich at four and Anthony at five, you know, we, I think we won by one and Dame had 40 and he had 20 in the fourth quarter. So it took a gargantuan effort on the road to get that one. So, you know, we were far more conservative in our expectations of that series than I think the pundits were that all picked us to, you know, to win it. Because I think we knew just how good they were and how unique they are with playing Anthony at five. in your eyes? I don't know. Is it excess in your guys' eyes? <laughs> For me uh, personally, I think the way it ended takes a lot away from it. Okay. And that's fair. And I think you have to look at it three-way. I think you look at the regular season where we had great success. Um, we had the third seed, which is the highest this organization has been seeded in two decades. I think the postseason couldn't have been worse. So... You know, I mean, I don't know that you can even have a happy medium that you can, I don't think you can even look at it as one consistent theme. I, I think you really have to look at them separately. And I think, you know, there's a lot of positives we need to take away from the regular season. And then there's a lot of issues we need to address based on the result of, you know, the very abbreviated postseason. But I don't even know that the postseason honestly was long enough to blend it in with the other 82 games. Well, you know, ask the guys that, you know, finished four through 15, right? Um, you know, I, I think we sat in this room last year and, you know, last year we crept into the playoffs. And then, you know, and the question mark was, can we ever be a team that can host a playoff series? You know, can we get home court advantage, finish in the top four? How do you go about doing that? We did it. We, we did it with internal growth, excellent coaching. We did it with teamwork. We did it with guys that play well together, that play in a system. Um, we did it with guys that contributed in different areas. Guys were asked throughout the year to step up and also step back at times. Um, that's how we did it, and we'll continue to do that. I mean, we're building a team. And, you know, like I said, I don't have all the answers for you today. Everybody wants to know that there's some magical free agent. There's some incredible trade. There's some draft pick that's going to revolutionize your franchise. And, you know, a lot of times you don't know where the help is coming from. You know, some of it is how you change the lineup. You know, someone, someone that you don't expect to step up. I mean, who would have thought Al Farouk Camino was going to spend most of the season shooting 40% from three? But he did, 
right? You know, the reinsertion of Mo Harkless into the starting lineup. We go 17 and three with Mo as a starter. Um, you know, we get, you know, we get great, you know, Nurk started out slow, played well. So, it, you know, it takes some time. I mean, you know, um, we lost last night. Okay, nobody expected it. Nobody anticipated it. It happened. And we've now got 10 weeks to kind of address and build the team heading into free agency in the summer and trades. And we'll do what we always do, Joe. We'll draft, trade, player development, free agency, and we'll build the roster. There seems to be an upswell among some fans that want, you know, sweeping changes. How do you, do, do you see this on, as a more of a tweak, tweaking the roster this summer or, or making significant The changes? same people that wanted sweeping changes last year? Right, great. Well, you know, last year was going to take sweeping changes because we got we got swept by Golden State in the first round, and all the alarmists overreacted. And then Golden State went on to sweep Utah, and sweep San Antonio, and basically, you know, win in five without breaking a sweat against Cleveland. And everybody overreacted. So let's be a little bit measured in our reaction to the fact that we ended up against a tough matchup with the best two-way player in the NBA having a career series. Drew is healthy, and he played phenomenal basketball. It happens. But again, th th this idea of you know, sleeping, where were, where were all these people that wanted sleeping changes 10 days ago? Where were they? They were the ones you know, bouncing off the walls in the Moda Center when we had the third seed for the first time since 1999-2000. So it's our job, Joe, to be measured and not overreact, because when you overreact is when you make mistakes. Nobody thinks this roster is a finished product. Everybody understands it is a work in progress, but it's a work in progress. But you know, relative to people that back in December were complaining we weren't even going to make the playoffs and we were in purgatory because we weren't going to make the playoffs and we weren't going to pick high enough, and right, that, that was the rallying cry. Then it was, oh my God, well, they're going to blow the third seed because they're going to lose all these games down there. They're not even going to get home court advantage. They overreacted to that. And you know what? If the series goes six or seven, if game one goes differently, when we have the ball down one, like, who knows where the series goes? But it didn't. But again, you don't take four games and overreact and diminish what you accomplished over 82 games. The foundation is built during the regular season. There are always ex extraneous factors that go into a playoff series. And look, we're the first ones out. So this will be heightened, and there'll be over an over amount of attention paid to this series until other teams start going out. And then they'll all need sweeping changes. Does how you guys finish this regular season <clears throat> set a new bar for the team or expectations? Is Look the, look, the bar is always the same. You know, um, you know, you're trying to be a factor in the playoffs. You're trying to be, you know, a team that can advance in the playoffs and see what happens. Um, and you're trying to put the best team possible on the floor. And you're trying to do that while growing, not just looking for help externally, but growing from within. Um, you know, I thought this was the most competitive roster we've had in the three years since we kind of entered into this rebuild. Um, you know, I thought Damian showed great leadership. Uh, you know, throughout the course of the year, I think we probably had more ebbs and flows this season than we did in the first two years. Because the first two years, we just started off really slow and made runs late, right? And it was kind of almost two distinct seasons. This one was up and down throughout. We had to face a lot of adversity throughout the year. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes people get too high and they also get too low. And when all is said and done, you know, weeks down the road, we'll look back and realize we lost in the first round. And whether it was four to three or four nothing isn't going to change the fact that in the regular season, a lot of the teams that are playing in the playoffs right now, we either swept, split with, beat, and we'll realize how competitive we were. So you trust the team that you saw in the regular season more than the team that we just saw over the last weeks, 10 days? Well, again, I would rather trust a team that I saw over 82 games than a team I saw over four games. When you, know, you, know, you mentioned excellent coaching, could you talk about the job that Coach Stotts and his staff did this year? Yeah, I mean, look, what do you what do you expect? You know, from a coaching staff, do your players get better? They did. There was internal growth. Do you are you competitive every night? Did you improve on areas where you struggled in the past? You know. Um, 
you know, one of the things people talked about, you know, when we sat in this room again a year ago, was everybody complained about our defense. It was ranked 26th in the league. It finished ranked eighth, right? That's growth. Young teams take longer to develop a defensive mindset. It's harder for young teams to defend well. Usually veteran teams are those defensive teams. Offensively, I think we actually took a little bit of a step back this year because there was such a focus on the defensive end, and that's what the, defen the defense and rebounding carried us during some of the early parts of the season when the offense struggled. I mean, Terry can speak more to that. Um, but there's never a question about, about coaching or the fact that we, whether we were or were not prepared going into a game. That was stipulated. Like I said, we ran into a, a well-coached team with a superstar player that plays both ways, that played a unique style relative to how they had played the first three times we played them during the regular season. They played it really well. And I think the one thing they did a phenomenal job of was they imposed their style of play on us. And, you know, and, and they, they came out victorious as a result. In light of the financial uh, restrictions you have this summer, what vehicles do you view as you're most likely to, to help the roster? It's, it's always the same. It's draft, trade, player development, free agency. Um, you know, you know, like, you know, people get caught up in financial restrictions. First of all, half the league is at or will be in the – right, Sean? I see Sean smiling, and he started typing because he knows the salary cap. So half the league is projected to be in the salary cap next year. Okay, it's a result of the cap spike from two years ago, increased spending. That's the way it is. But, you know, there's a million ways to build a team, and I think – Everybody gets caught up on thinking there's some magic solution because you have cap room or you have an exception or you have – that's not necessarily true. If you look at how many teams got better this year because of trade or draft-related moves versus teams that got a free agent to come into their cap room, the teams that did the former improved greater than the teams that just signed the free agent. That's how it works. So like I said, guys are going to continue to get better. There's still a lot of upside on the roster. We have our first round draft pick. We'll be active at the draft as usual. Um, you know, we've been active and opportunistic in trades. We've found value players. We'll continue to do that. But again, one of the things I think I'm, I'm disappointed with from a narrative standpoint from this whole year that nobody picked up on was this. How important the quality of your players and building a team is to winning and losing basketball games. Everybody wants to look in a vacuum at specific players. This player, this player, this player. His numbers, his numbers, his numbers. And what nobody looked at was the chemistry, the camaraderie, the teamwork, the way this group stayed together. We'd lose three or four in a row. They never fractured. It frustrated guys in the media because you'd ask Dame or you'd ask CJ, they said, we're fine, we're fine. And nobody wanted to believe that we were fine. And yet somehow we ended up with 49 wins and we're the third seed in the Western Conference. We were fine. They believed it. They're the ones that have to believe, and they believe in each other, and they elevate each other. It's one of the things we talked about with Dame's leadership. Dame's great ability from a leadership standpoint is to get guys to elevate their play to a level they can play at by increasing everybody's level of play, 5 10 15%, because of the empowerment he gives them, in aggregate adds another player, another impact player. And I think that's the hardest thing at times is you know, this isn't NBA 2K. Not The teams with, across the board, the highest profile names on their teams aren't necessarily the best teams. And it comes down to coaching and culture and organization and team building and character. And that's what you saw during the ebbs and flows of our year, that, that it never fractured in here, ever. Not once. You never heard one story about it fracturing relationships player to player, player to coach, the organization, organization to coach, ever, not once. You never heard that. And that's what kept everybody together. And that bond is why even losing in four will give us something to build on instead of something to regret. Have you spoken with Paul since the season ended? And what was his message? Yeah, I was with Paul last night. What was his message? His message was we had a great regular season. He was proud of the way we competed. He, he was proud of the fact that even last night when we got down 15, we never stopped fighting. But based on the regular season, we had larger aspirations than a first-round playoff exit, and we need to find a way to get better. I mean, right? Is that what pretty, pretty much. much covered? Yep. Coach, I was going to ask in terms of what Neil was talking about, the chemistry of this team, how it would never fractured this season. If you've been coaching a while, would you say that this team, 
last year was probably a team that had the most chemistry as a team that you coached before. Uh, well, I, I put this team in with the last two seasons. You know, uh, I think the building that this team, Dame, CJ, Farouk, Ed, uh, that group that came in uh, in 2015, that they have grown together. And then you throw in Pat Connaughton and, and how that group has. So it is uh, a very tight-knit group because they've grown together over the last three years. And I think this year has been a culmination of that. Um, well, I'm not going to evaluate the job I did, but I will say, uh, like everybody, I thought we had a very good regular season. I thought we had a very disappointing end of the season. I mean, it's it's simple as that. Um, the the as Neil mentioned, the ebbs and flows, highs and lows. You know, having a six game home losing streak, getting off uh, to a poor start, uh, or I shouldn't say poor start, but a disappointing start. Our defense was what carried us. I don't think anybody saw that coming. Um, the way the way we came together after the All Star break and and played our best basketball, uh, seeing guys like Mo Harkless kind of uh, really come on strong after the season, but ha go through a kind of a roller coaster season. Uh, I thought Neil said best. Last two years we just came on strong and made a push after All Star break. The last two years, this year was was more challenging because. Of, of the highs and lows and the, the relative inconsistency. Um, but I've said for a long time, this group is I'm just, we had seven players be late this year in a whole season, in NBA season. I had seven fine slips total. Who were they? <laughs> and what would be a typical one? Huh? Except before game four, the whole team was late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, 20 or what, you know, what. But I mean, I, I just noticed that today because I was going through doing some paperwork. And it's just a good group of guys. You know, Evan Turner has come into his own as a really important part of this team, the team chemistry, and how much uh, the team enjoy appreciates what he does on the court. But also what he does in the locker room and as far as being a, a good person. And so I think there's a lot to be said for that. And that is one of the joys of, of coaching that you sometimes you don't get in the NBA. You know, college, high school, maybe you get that a little bit more. But um, it makes my job more enjoyable and easier when you have that. Neil, how would you, uh, I know you won't go into details, but regarding Nurkic's free agent status, how will you approach that? You're my guy, Joe. I love you. Because you always start with, I know you I know you won't answer this, <laughs> but I have to ask it anyway so I can say yeah. that Neil didn't answer it. Yeah, you're both doing your job. <laughs> you're both got a job we're to both, do. We're covered now, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we can't. I mean, you're, you know, Joe, we can't discuss free agency. I mean, look, he's a restricted free agent, and, um, you know, and we'll handle that when free agency starts. But, you know, he's not the only restricted free agent on the roster. You know, Pat's restricted. Shabazz is restricted. You know, Ed's unrestricted. So when we've got... We've got some, you know, some guys we've got to deal with internally, and we'll, like I said, we'll handle that. Right now, um, you know, we're we're trying to, you know, get through our exit interviews with our guys, and you know, check in on them, make sure they have what they need heading into the off season, and set the plan for the young guys as far as what we expect from them in the off season, prepping for summer league, and um, you know, in a you know a couple of weeks, we'll get to Chicago and start working on the draft. Do you share the city's love of Ed Davis? Yeah, of course, everybody does. I signed him. No, but not only did we sign him, but uh, I think Ed's role on the team and within the city, I mean, he's, yeah. I think he he gained a special part, uh, place for everybody in Portland by the way he, st uh, the way he plays, but also uh, his presence in the locker room. Uh, he's about the right thing. So I was, I was really pleased that Ed came back after a frustrating year last year with injuries to have the year that he had in a year that personally was important for him going into free agency. And, and another guy happy that he left L.A. and came to Portland, along with me. So there you go. <laughs> hold it. Hold on. <laughs> Can you, hold. I know you're recording. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 65 and sunny today, Joe. It's warmer here today than it is in Manhattan Beach. Yeah. Yep. 
When when twenty seven other teams aren't jealous of our backcourt, then I'll I'll start worrying about, you know. And we you know one of the things, Sean. I said I said to somebody last night. You know, they're asking about you know, can you win with two six three guards? We just got swept by a team that started three guards under six four. So I don't know what our two guys have to do with it. You know, obviously you're very positive about despite this sweep that the team just endured. What gives you so much optimism about this roster or, or this new? Well, you know, I think the growth, Joe, you know, um, you know, like, I mean, look, last we had an eight game improvement over last year. Um, I think if you asked anybody and we gave some games away this year, I mean, I don't even know that the, re the record is 100 percent reflective, you know, what I mean, of what it was capable of, because we, you know, we did have some ebbs and flows and lost some games that I think if you look back on the schedule, you would have, you know, you would have checked off as as wins. Um, and then we also won some games. I don't think anybody expected us to win, but. I think when we look at how competitive we are with the teams that were in our conference, that were in our division, um, that are playing at a really high level right now and how we performed against them, um, knowing internally what these guys, you know, the, the amount of work that they put in. And I think more than anything, the biggest question mark I think we've all had that goes beyond whether or not we have two guards in our backcourt under 6'3", you know, would Nurk become a player or anything else? The biggest question was always, can this group, as constructed, have an impact defensively? And I think from a coaching standpoint, from a player commitment standpoint, to get buy-in for guys that, quite honestly, like other than, other than Farouk and maybe Mo, are really guys that probably came into the league as offensive players. To get that kind of buy-in from a, an individual and team concept that that's, what, that's why we, we did play so well on the road until this series, because the defense traveled. And I don't know that, you know, I mean, look, I think the coaches believed, but I don't know that we believed that we could, with this group, have a top 10 defense for the entire NBA season. And we did. And I think there were even guys looking at it, analytics-based, you know, guys looking at it back in November, December, wondering if it was sustainable or if it was a byproduct of a soft beginning of the schedule. And it was. And when you can be in the top 10 all year over an 82-game schedule with, with, with a predominantly offensive-oriented roster, it's a testament to the job the coaches did. And it's also, you know, kudos to the players that they were able to adapt a totally different mindset as two-way guys as opposed to just trying to outscore people on the other end of the floor. You mentioned Mo, and Mo mentioned your guys' message to him and how important he was to this team. Is that one thing that you learned is that maybe he's a, he's a separator between – you know, and I give credit, you know, to Zach, Zach Williams, you know, who runs our analytics because he, he's probably the biggest Mo backer, you know, whenever, you know, whenever things were down, he just kept, you know, all the numbers kept showing how important Mo was to us. Um, you know, last year when we finished strong throughout the year, we were at our best with Mo and Farouk at three, four. Um, it got even better when Nurk came in. And I think we saw that this year. I think Mo admittedly got off to a slow start. You know, so did Nurk. We were sluggish early. I think we had a soft schedule that we didn't really take advantage of, and guys weren't playing at their level. And then, you know, Terry reinserted Mo into the starting lineup. Evan was dinged up a little bit with his calf strain, so he was on limited minutes. And, you know, we went on a 17-3 to run. So, um, you know, Mo is a, is a high-impact guy for us. He gives us a lot of defensive versatility. He can score in transition. He makes a lot of things at 3-4 switchable with Farouk. Um, you know, he can guard one through four. And, you know, he's probably the best athlete on the team. So he is. He's a linchpin to a lot of things we do. And I think a lot of the guys that are kind of in the know, when Mo went down late in the year, there were guys that knew that this was going to be a huge loss for us. And that's not using injury as an excuse. That's just answering your question about how important Mo playing at the level he's capable of. I mean, you know, you forget we lost one of our best defenders. Mo was also second in the NBA in three-point field goal percentage after the trade deadline behind Doug McDermott. He was shooting 54.5%. He went from shooting 31 to 41.5 on the season. I mean, he, you know, he, I, think, I don't have it in front of me. I don't know where Myers ended up on a smaller sample size, but I think Mo ended up leading our team in three-point shooting for the regular season. So, that, you know, that's a big deal. You know, everybody's looking for three and D guys. Well, there you go. And he's still only 24 years old. So, you know, he is. And I, and I think... I think we'll see a more consistent Mo next year, realizing he needs to come in day one and play at that level that he's capable of. Now the one you've been waiting for, how would you evaluate Zach's uh, growth and his importance to this franchise moving forward? Look, 
you know, I, I think I think Mo, I, I think Zach played really well for us, and I think he did what he was asked to do. I think he had an impact defensively. Um, you know, we finished the season regular season number one in the league in rim protection. A lot of that was Nurk and Ed, but a lot of that was Zach at four as well. Um, you know, his length, his ability as a rookie to learn and establish a reputation with the referees that he knew how to play verticality without picking up fouls that he had done, you know, early in the year and in summer league. Um, I also think he did a lot of things for us as a team in terms of floor balance because he shared the floor with Ed, who was one of our most productive lineups. Um, but he played far away from the basket. Um, you know, he got to three-point range probably earlier than maybe we even would have liked. Um, I don't know if he was ready for that, but it opened up the court, let Ed be a dive guy, let Ed be an offensive rebounder. Um, and I think what he did most importantly, Joe, was as a 10th pick in the draft, he had earned his stripes. You know, it wasn't handed to him, you know, day one. He joined a playoff team that was a returning playoff team, a team with playoff aspirations, and other guys got opportunities before him at that position. You know, Caleb got a shot, Noah got a shot, Farouk was a starter. So I think when he got on the floor, it was with the backing and the endorsement and the respect of the veterans in the locker room that he had earned it. And that's a bigger hurdle to climb than just playing minutes. Anybody can get minutes in the NBA. And I think one of the things that will accelerate Zach's growth was not only did he earn it, but his minutes came playing on a team playing for for something other than just getting their rookies' minutes. And I think that gives him a foundation to build on. Good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.